Hello and thank you for joining me today with Invisible Not Broken. Today I'm going to be talking to Don about amyloidosis, what not to ask sick people, and the best ideas for Airbnb. We're also going to be covering one of my favorite topics because I'm still trying to figure it out, how to talk to your children about your illness when you are chronically sick. Invisible illness does not get much more invisible than with Dawn. The first time she told me she was sick, I was ridiculously shocked. She seems to glow with energy and she is one of the kindest, sweetest people and most generous I've ever met. I really hope you enjoy listening to Dawn and her story and um, try to listen all the way to the end because her point on not asking sick people how are you doing is a a really good one to think about and her solution for what to say instead. I think I'm going to be using that daily. If you enjoy the podcast, please hit subscribe and I would always love a embarrassingly sweet, loving review on iTunes. Until next week, be kind, be gentle, and be a badass. My name is Dawn. My disease, rare disease, is hereditary amyloidosis. And as the name suggests, it has been passed down through my family through, so far, five generations. My, it's from my mother's side. My mother and her brother both had this and they died from complications of this, of this disease. My grandmother had it um, and it was discovered, her, the disease was discovered uh, back in 1986. Wow, so how is how would they be able to diagnose something like that? that uh, for in? them back then, without any biomarkers um, or any genetic testing, it was just through symptoms. And can you symptoms. list some of the symptoms that you experience? Yeah, so it's neuropathy, much like fibromyalgia, that comes and goes. You know, there's bad days and good days. Um, and it starts with with the, the neuropathy, the tingling and burning in the fingertips and at the bottom of the foot. And then as the disease progresses, it slowly moves upward. So right now, last year, it was at the bottom of my feet, and now I can feel it slowly moving to the top of my feet. It was at my fingertips. I can feel it moving down. Um, and I only notice these things like typing. I used to be prolific <laughs> at thinking and typing at the computer, and my fingers just don't go where they should. I'm, I'm a, I have to peck. <laughs> <Which is laughs> I like weird. the pecking idea. <laughs> yeah, peck. Um, so it's it starts with that, and it's a multi-system disease. So it's 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 in it's hepatic. It's you know distributed through the blood. It's neurological. Um, it's this one errant protein that your liver produces. Um, that and everybody else that's healthy. Um, produces retinol for your eyes and thyroxine for thyroid hormones and for me it's a for our family it's uh, adult onset mid 40s and this errant protein the body cannot recognize it it doesn't know what to do with it it can't it's not soluble so the body can't flush it out through the kidneys and and send it out through the urine um, so it sits on um, um, and this develops like just like sand almost in the capillaries and the small bloodstreams of the fingers and, the, and attaches itself to neurons um, in the fingertips. And then as it becomes more dis- uh, distributed through the body, it starts to affect organs. And typically it affects people um, with their stomach. Their stomach can't, it's called gastroparesis, where the stomach can't flush food through down because the, the neurators that say, yes, do this, are disabled. So the muscles aren't being told to contract. Um, Same thing happens with um, the ureters um, from the kidneys. They they don't tell the bladder to to void itself, so you get incontinence, both urinary and fecal incontinence. And for men, it's, it's, um, they notice it you start seeing men come in to, to to their doctors when they're getting erectile dysfunction. So 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 much to say about that. Thing. So so <laughs> much to say, but yeah. So that that is the disease. It's multi system. It I multi specialists 
um, and less than 12,000 people in the nation, certainly less than 20,000 worldwide. So it's incredibly rare. Yeah. So how, um, I guess the only way to really understand and ask for the diagnosis would be if you'd watched your family go through it. Right. For this particular strain, so there's, there's, there's different types there's, they call it AL, amyloid light chain, and that acts more like, they treat it more like cancer. It's in the bone marrow. And then there's wild type, where it's a spontaneous mutation. And then there's hereditary. Um, so if you had a rich family background of and, 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 and were all together rather than disparate through the country, you would know your time might be coming. Um, back in 2004, I chose to get genetic testing and thankfully there was um, GINA protections against those with genetic conditions um, and that that was part of it um, unfortunately I didn't get life insurance so now I can only oh. get very small levels low levels of health insur of life insurance I can't I can't get the full coverage that everyone else would get and that was something I didn't arrange before previous to my genetic counseling. And how old were you when you got your genetic counseling? Or genetic testing. I was 31, 30, 31 years old. So how old were you, and I know that you took care of your mother, but how old were you for yourself when this became a daily issue? For, for me personally? Mm -hmm. Uh, 44. Okay. But I had, I had been doing the one kind of gold standard for diagnosis is a tissue biopsy. So I had been getting tissue biopsies starting at the age of 40 um, just to try and see if I could catch it very early. Just really puts into perspective medical arts because it is <laughs> such a, um, a crapshoot on so much of, of diagnostics. Mm, exactly. And that's the one diagnostic that you can hang on to. Otherwise, doctors, when I went in to a, the one specialist in Boston that knows there of in hereditary amyloidosis there are 120 known strains my strain genetic strain belongs to a subcategory of ten, uh, within 10 known strains that are even more rare where the disease crosses the blood brain barrier and and begins to act like alzheimers so um that one specialist in Boston has been following our family since the mid late 80s. And when I went to go see him with my rich family history mm -hmm. and my, my, new, my new symptoms, um, I thought I had, had inflammation. Because the drug that I got on, that's a stabilizer, made me feel better. So it was his hypothesis that I was not actually <laughs> amyloidogenic in disease process that I was dealing with inflammation until the next day when I got a positive biopsy, then he completely backpedaled. Which, thank goodness you had that, because it isn't absolutely certain that if you have this and you have the biopsy that you could easily be negative and you would have lost a lot of time before treatment. My cousin is getting treatment without a positive biopsy, but the doctors at the clinic where she visits for her treatment tell her every time she's there that they doubt the disease is present in her body. Which one would like to think is good news, but... <laughs> it's not, because they're changing... That's my clumsy butterfingers. <laughs> um, oh, oh, it's okay. Um, for anyone who's listening, my, I'm having a massive attack, and holding things are, are not working today. <laughs> um, so I know you don't want to talk too much about your treatment, uh -huh. but are you comfortable just saying kind of what you physically have to go through to get to yes. your treatment? Because yes. I think that's... Pretty important Pretty since you have a family of young children and a seven, husband. Nine and seven. Do you, I know you don't want to talk about the, the details of it, but yes. you just want to talk about what you have to do to get there? Yeah, so it's an investigational trial, um, which is, is the bonus in that I don't have a placebo. Is they still, st within clinical trials, even though we're an orphan disease, they still want a placebo, which is basically, and you have to be very ill to qualify, so you're almost donating your body to science. <laughs> Um, so this investigational trial doesn't require placebo and it has no preconditions for qualifications. It, 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 you have to have neuropathy and you have to have a, um, a, a clean bill of health for your heart and that's it. So it's pretty amazing. 
that I'm able to to get in early, mm -hmm. um, especially since when it when it becomes FDA approved, it's going to be very expensive, and I'm going to have to battle hard with my insurance. So it's an infusion, and it's um, the clinics are coming up nationwide, but the closest right now that I can get to is in Dallas, Texas. So I'm traveling every 21 days. To, to Dallas. Dallas in the summer. <laughs> in the summer to get treatment. Um, I'm sure there, there's a clinic in Oregon. I'm desperately trying to get a hold of so I could transfer there. Fingers crossed being Fingers here in crossed. California. <laughs> yes, that would be much better. Stanford was supposed to come up, but they, um, just for their own bureaucracy, haven't been able to. And why the rush for me is that there is a finite quantity of this medication that they can provide to people worldwide. They have enough guaranteed medication for 50 people worldwide. So the sooner I get in, the better. So the numbers on this are 20,000 people worldwide. And uh, yeah. they have enough for... 50 people. 50 people in the world. So that's Yeah, staggering. I've won the long. I've won the lottery. You won the lottery in the weirdest way possible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah in the mess, most messed up way. Yeah, so getting in on treatment was 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 our was the primary goal within our family, no matter where it was. Mm -hmm. um, and now that I have a closer clinic, I'm now trying to get transferred to that clinic. And are all the traveling costs on you? Yes, insurance. Whom I called said because it's investigational, um, they wouldn't cover it, and they typically only cover travel costs for for organ transplants. Mm -hmm. Which, um, here's my phone ringing, I'm going to... So, insurance will only cover organ transplant, which is pretty crazy because an organ transplant for me means a tackle box full of anti-rejection medication that keeps my body from rejecting a new liver but does nothing for my overall health. So it would put me in a, in, in a worse position than not having, at this point. Um, and not only that, it can take up to five years to get a trans, to get an organ. So there's, it's, it's a very, um, liver transplant was never an option for me. So for you, because you, you watched your mother go through mm -hmm. this and your uncle, um, I know this has always been a part of your life. Were there things that you were able to enjoy before you personally got sick that you're missing right now? Oh, definitely. I miss, wait, from... The, for me personally, or mm -hmm. for you personally, as I know that like for some of us, we get surprised by our diagnosis. We didn't have yes. this was not um, something that was in our wheelhouse. This was not something that we were aware of, and there are pluses and minuses to both sides. Oh, definitely. Um, but for you, you've always yeah, you, you've always had the book written a little bit for you. You've always you've at least seen what was going to happen. What were you able to do before that? Now that you personally are ill, that you miss doing. I was very active. Um, and exercise was a way, a, a refuge for my being a stay-at-home parent. Um, just being a, a, a lively, engaged person. <laughs> and for my overall well-being, I just felt it centered me in a way that nothing else could. Um, um, I, I deeply enjoyed cycling, and not just, like, tooling around town. It was a road bike, my clip and shoes and going straight up Redwood Road until my heart rate hit 172. That that brought me joy. Mm -hmm. And now is it the neuropathy that's keeping you? Yeah, neuropathy and just um, I, my, my ability, my metabolic system is not as efficient. So my heart rate, my, my, my ability to keep up, um, to, to, to be on the edge of that lactate threshold... It's just my system is changing, and I can see that. And I, I just, putting myself at the red zone mm -hmm. doesn't seem smart right now. <laughs> Where before, I, I got much joy I, I, from putting myself at the red zone. Now it's just not smart, I don't think, until I can get some treatment and get some of this, these proteins out of my body and, and, and also just get my stability back. I, I, I don't feel agile any longer where I, I, I did. I used to jump rope. So we'd go to the gym, I'd jump rope, I'd lift weights. And to me, we've talked about this throwing around weights, just I felt powerful. I felt strong. I felt like I could, I 
And not only that, it gave me a way to rid myself of stress of going from being a professional woman all my adult life to a stay-at-home parent where my duties totally changed and recognition for those duties totally changed. I, not even being sick. Like, just yeah. take the sick thing out of this. Going from college and professional right. life to please take your finger out of your nose is like... Yeah, don't it, touch it your It is brothers. a mind fuck. It yeah. is such a, like, a, everything that you worked hard to do and you were trained to do now doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and no. you're supposed to acquire very different skill sets and the new boredom threshold. Mm, right. And I, and I also, to deal with that boredom threshold, I took my kids places. We did stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I take my kids on bike rides because I'm like, let's get out of this house. <laughs> let's burn some energy. I want you to feel this joy of exercise mm -hmm. that I got at, and, and, and enjoy it at a younger age and enjoy being outside. Um, I, I, I don't do that as much because it just, I don't feel as strong. I'm sure I could push myself. And there are days that I felt like I, I can. And then there are other days where I just, I don't have the spoons. I just. <laughs> so we're talking about the spoon theory, which yeah. is you only have so many spoons in a day. And like one spoon could be brushing your teeth. One spoon could be making breakfast for yourself. Mm -hmm. I would give it three spoons to make breakfast for the kids. Yeah. Um, so you only get so many of these things a day. It's a way to visualize the energy. energy level for chronically ill people. That you bank your energy for mm -hmm. tasks. We're always talking about going into the negative spoons in right. this house. Like. Yeah. Yeah. So having enough spoons. And, you know, overall my health as well. And this is also what is a bummer is it to be invisible but not broken is that no one sees me as ill. Um, which is positive and negative. You know, my in-laws didn't ask me not one question about how I'm feeling, about what my treatment. We just spent five days together, and there was there was no inquiry about how I'm doing, how I'm feeling, how how this you know how this is going to impact our family, our finances. How, are we going to be okay? And not that I we I need any assistance, financial or otherwise. It's just. The parenting aspect that my mom yeah. would have done. Yes. That's missing. So I know they're not here to talk about this, yes. but just from your own perspective, and I think even I struggle with like, what do I ask? What don't I ask? Are you wanting to talk about yeah. this? Are you not? And I'm sick. And yeah. I still don't always know the right answer, the right the right things to ask. Um, do you, do you ever do you feel like it might be something about just they don't they this isn't in their wheelhouse they don't know or is this a lack of concern or is this fear? I don't think it's a lack of concern. I think it's fear. It's culture that's not in, within their personal culture to want to dig yeah. through the muck of feelings. <laughs> that's just not their thing. So that's that's definitely a large part of it, and it's always been uh, a, a a cultural abyss between us um, that I very much want talk about things and sort things out and they just that's just not their style so that's that's an element um and it, pretending it's not there I think it's easier for them to pretend it's not there that way they don't have to worry about it does any of that spill over into your other friendships and relationships mm -hmm. definitely I mean I've um there's friends I no longer um tr there's friendships I no longer try to maintain and, and if they come back to me, that's great. But it's just either one too much work or I, I having to explain that I'm not dying is just t t taxing. <laughs> How do you explain? <laughs> I mean, your, your disorder is tremendously dangerous. Right. Um, it's not... Uh, it's not like something like what I have where this is, uh, I'm fighting for a lifestyle, I'm fighting to walk, you're <laughs> fighting for your life. That's mm -hmm. a very different... That's a very different divide there. How do you explain where you're at with your treatment to your friends? Or do you try? If they ask, I then provide that information. I'm, I'm no longer... In the beginning, I felt like I volunteered to anyone who wanted to talk about it. <laughs> and then I realized the looks I got from people like, wow, that is so incredibly messed up. Or fear. Just fear fear come across her face and be like, N I don't need any of that. I, I, just <laughs> I have my own well of terror. Totally. <laughs> Please don't match the well of terror. <laughs> totally. I keep a quite tight lid on all that fear and I don't need you coming in monkey wrenching. Like so yeah, I, I, I think I, I definitely pick and choose uh, 
who I might speak with, who I might engage that discussion with. But it is, I am standing on a crumbling cliff, much like Big Sur. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Uh, and just as pretty. <laughs> just as, you know, aw, you're so sweet. But um, there could be a huge landslide, and, I, and yeah. then I've lost, I've, uh, the damages are irreparable. It, it cannot be dammed up. Um, that's why it was so incredibly important to get the treatment that I will be getting this early on in my process that I'm able, I'm not going to lose as much before it becomes um, dangerous. And with your, you've been married for how long? It's been 11 years since 2006. Yeah, 11 years. Yeah, oh wow, got married the same year. (laughs) Um, How does he deal with this? He's aware of it. He saw your uncle go through the last stages, is that correct? Yeah, the last three years of his life. He'd seen him deteriorate. So how does he handle what you're going through? Um, he does a lot of checking in. How are you doing? How was your day? And then just waits for me to either say, fine, or... <laughs> and then he's like, okay, we're not talking about it. Oh, good, so you can distinguish fines. Like, there's different tone of voice with fine. Uh-huh. Because <laughs> there was about a year... years he's got it. He's got the fine... Which means not now. Um, and, you know, I told him, like, you know, I'm just, I'm tired. I'm really tired. And he's like, okay, what do you need me to do? So he waits for me, like a general, to say, I need mm-hmm. you to do this, I need you to do this, I need, I need you to empty the dishwasher. I just couldn't get to it. I need you, I need your help tonight. I need you to sit, we're going to sit down and we're going to look over the calendar. We're going to do this. You know, he, he waits for me to assign tasks. Which is great. Um... I think I could do a better job of letting him in on doing more. I think we could both be better. But he, he, he is basically when he comes home, he, he does a lot of sniffing me out. <laughs> we met the dog park, by the way, <laughs> so which is why I just could not stop laughing right there. Um, I just love this like image yeah. of just circling around, just are you okay? Are Nervous? You, yeah. What's what's what would you eat? How, how's your poop today? Um, All the romance of marriage, right there. <laughs> so you know, it's and it's we went, we're coming out the other side, but there was a year I just felt like there was this trip line in our marriage. And neither one of us would know when we would set off the IED, but it would go off. And then we're in a full-blown argument. And I, 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 and I saw the pattern. And that was something that was always present, but this felt, m- felt more dangerous. It just felt like an argument came out of nowhere. And um, I realized how, and now that I have treatment, I, I realized I felt like I had this buzz of stress. So when he would ask me a question, I would lunge back. And Mm. then he would be defensive. So it was this cold war of (laughs) sensitivity and emotions and stress that both of us weren't recognizing but were reacting to. Um, And it's, it's, I can feel that kind of, the the, the engagement, the Mm de-engagement, disengagement of, of emotional defensiveness. He's not here, so we can ask, I can't ask him this question, but do you know of any way that he has to have an outlet for how he feels or his stress about this? Stress? I would say he loves to garden. He likes to tinker. So time that he can get to be on his own and just work with his hands, I'd like to give him. Or if he wants to go out with, you know, hey, I'm going to meet this friend tonight at 8 o'clock for beers. Is that, are you going to be all right? Yeah, go. Help me get the kids into bed, and then go. Just know that all this laundry here, yeah. <laughs> not folding. It, it will stay there. <laughs> Waiting for you. The Mickey Mouse Fantasia moment is not right. going to happen. It's not going to happen. So that, that would certainly be, um, I think, would be his. And he exercises while he swims. Um, and I, he enjoys his work, which I'm, I'm happy for. So that's certainly an outlet. Um, and I'm just doing stuff with the kids. I think that's that, that keeps it... Eat enough. I don't know. I think. <laughs> oh, I, I hear you. I just, I'm so curious about the caretakers. I 
my husband's a fantastic, wonderful caretaker, mm-hmm. and he doesn't have a lot of outlets to yeah. like handle what he's dealing with with what I have. And mm-hmm. I mean, for what you're going through, the future's a, a different thing, and it's um, it's definitely. I would think more scary for your husband with what the future is going to be like. And I'm always concerned about men because I feel like they don't have the training to, yeah. to go and be like, I am scared to death. I need to talk about this. <laughs> like, right. I, I feel like we were trained as women to, to go to our friends or people we were close to. And or go, seek people. I'm losing my mind here. Is this normal? <laughs> right. Or seek people that you feel are your cohorts. You exactly. Know? You know, that I got a dog because I thought you know, the kids wanted it, but also I needed it. And then I'm like, well, I need to go to the dog park because I can't always exercise her the way she needs. And then here we are. We meet yeah. at the dog park, and it's like it was meant to be, but we seek each other out. You know, it's like I need that person to who relates. And I don't I don't see him finding that. None of his friends, their, their wives are all healthy. Mm-hmm. None of them have been dealt this. And he has a wonderful friend, but I don't think even his one of his closest friends gets it so you know it's like what you mentioned earlier it's the healthy world versus the sick world i feel like it's an alice in wonderland thing that you fall Mm -hmm. down the rabbit hole and there's no preparing someone for it Mm -mm. so i i you know i i hope i hope his tinkering and his ability to exercise and and have these quiet moments are his outlet to turn off his brain and and not think and give himself some um inner calmness but there was a while that was really hard between us that you know I was arguing with my best friend and I hated it and I felt the furthest away from the person I wanted to be closest to and that that it was it felt awful because I I fell in love with this person because of his his ability to emote and his ability to understand me and just because of the person who he is, I, 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 I fell in love with all of it. Mm-hmm. And to feel far away from it. When you already feel alienated in this disease. Yeah. was really hard. And that's something that's not talked about enough, I feel like, is the alienation. Like, mm-hmm. it's a, a lonely, lonely space. <laughs> and mm-hmm. sick world is lonely. No one knows what to ask you or if they should ask you or if they should talk to you. I mean, we've both talked about how many friends we've lost since mm-hmm. becoming symptomatic. And mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's like the great flight. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Everyone migrates away and you, you're there. Mm-hmm. Well, it's almost like um, we're people whose children pass away and it's like almost like there's a bad luck thing where no one wants to get too close in case that, that touches them. That wears off on them. It's, right. Um, <laughs> they don't want to be touched by it. it like bad luck is a, a dis- as a, airborne illness or something right Con- yeah it's contagious Conta- thank you that was the word <laughs> we have a collective brain. oh uh, between the two of us mm-hmm. <laughs> we will get to the word yes so before you became sick what what would you do what would what would your life look like if you weren't sick what job would you have what I goals think, would you be pursuing i would think i'd be pursuing more te- teaching i did some substitute teaching this year and i i really did enjoy that i think also um i enjoy did more the administrative function of it so I could see myself wanting to be on a board of educators. Oh, you'd be so good at that. Oh, thank you. Um, just because in hearing some of these teachers' concerns, you know, the parents aren't... I think every parent should be in the classroom. And I know it's not possible for all families. But to see what the teachers have to deal with mm-hmm. and the expectations and the standards to meet and the children that come to class with their start line so far, far behind. Mm. And 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 knowing that they're they're moving children along that aren't getting the basic concepts. So I, I really do think that, that that is something I would be fighting for. Um, because I think our public education system, despite its faults, is pretty amazing. Um, and there's there's no reason we shouldn't be um, you know, ranked as low as we are in the world. Yes. My daughter's teacher did an amazing thing of handing out a blank piece of paper with one question written on it. What should I know about you? Aww. And that was at the beginning of the year. And like, my daughter wrote like 
a page of what she was dealing with, which was great because the teacher flagged her for needing emotional help dealing with how sick grandpa is, how sick mommy is, mm. um, all these other things she was dealing with, and she was able to get into a group counseling at the school, which was... Saved her. Oh, it was a 180. Yeah, I mean, truly, teachers that are that are, are good, it's a gift. It's a gift to, to be a parent and an educator wrapped up in one, and a, a mentor to the parents. Mm. Yeah, that, that bridge. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I, I definitely would foresee myself in that arena. Um, I Before being sick, I was at my uh, co-op preschool with some of my children, and I enjoyed that. I think my best parenting happened in that little small school. Um, so I, I definitely would foresee myself putting a lot of my energies towards that. Um, I'm, I've now also found, and uh, much like yourself, I find new ways for my energy, and so I, 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 I want to see myself now being more advocacy for patients. That like would be amazing. Patient Bill of Rights. I think there's, you know, you have these amazingly intelligent doctors, but they have zero people skills <laughs> because they've been bookworms their entire adult life. Uh, yeah, scientists to human would be a great dictionary or mm-hmm. translation for us. Right. So I try not to focus on what I can't do. Like yourself, I'm like, okay, what what do I what do I want now? What what's what's in front of me that I can affect change? So let's see. I think you're amazing, and um, what you're able to. Just hear your stories of calling all these doctors and calling all the administration and getting bounced from department to department as you're trying to just get the your life-saving care. Pretty I can't crappy. believe the amount of swamp water you have to swim through just to get to the basic level of, hey, I need this care. Mm-hmm. I've already emailed a doctor who's in charge of the clinic and... and don't know if he's going to get back to me. So I have to assume that he may not. So that's why I'm, I keep calling and calling and calling. And each day, maybe it may be that one person who picks up the phone and knows who to put, put me to. So every day, I keep calling. And this is the difference between you and me and what we have, where you're <laughs> fighting for your life, I'm fighting for a lifestyle. And if I have to go through more than three people, it's like, fine, I'm just sick then. <laughs> yeah, I just won't walk. That's fine. Whatever. No. But you don't have that option of, no. of giving up and you don't have someone like my mom who's like, I'll take this for you right. and I will make all the phone calls. Like I could never have gotten through disability on my own. The amount that they needed and the mm-hmm. amount of focus, I was too sick to be able to go through all those questions. And without mm. that advocate of my <laughs> amazing mother, I would never have been able to finish it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard being a patient and an advocate. At the same time, yeah. li- living in both worlds, I almost have to detach myself and be like, okay, I'm cold calling. This morning, I'm going to de- devote 20 minutes to cold calling, and then I'm going to let it go. And if I don't hear back, I'm going to follow up this afternoon. It'd be amazing if like retired hospital administrators or retired hospital CEOs just said, you know what, I need to do some more good in the world. I'm going right. to volunteer my time to being just an advocate for someone who's sick. I'm just going to... Help them get through this, and that'll be my volunteer work. For, I think that'd be such an amazing, like, nonprofit, or mm-hmm. because I mean, things like the advocacy. There are health advocates, but they're so expensive. It would be really, and it should be. That's yeah, a lot can, of work. Then you work. can afford a concierge doctor. You don't need all this. I've had a concierge doctor, and I still needed. Wow. Um, all of that, and um, it would just be amazing. And I do understand why they have to charge so much. Just so much legwork and time, but. Mm-hmm. A non-profit for this, for the people who can't afford the advocacy, that would... It would be pretty amazing. That would change lives. That would help people still be able to attain goals and, and get at least the care they need. Right. See, another non-profit idea I've had. I, <laughs> I have finders of non-profit ideas. <laughs> um, what could help you in this world make things easier aside from having a dedicated health advocate right? to make these phone calls for you every day because you seem to spend at least an hour on the phone every day calling yeah yeah I, I would say an hour every day whether it's, it's appointments or specialists I want to see need to see or um you know tracking down care um housekeeper <laughs> that would be fantastic a housekeeper would be great um, okay. So you don't spend your spoons. 
I don't spend cleaning, my Cleaning, you spend your spoons playing with your kids. Right, enjoying life. Someone who can get the laundry done. Um, someone who could scrub my disgusting floor. <laughs> um, and vacuum up the dog hair that's always wafting through my house. Yeah, Poppy has a Farrah Fawcett sort yes. of hairdo. She's that golden retriever is very... Oh, she is pretty. She's pretty hair, but yeah, she's, she sheds everywhere. So definitely a housekeeper. Um... Someone to help me organize my medical paperwork. Oh, wow. I wonder if there would be like a really good app for that. Yeah, because I have, what I have found is that, is that sometimes I don't get billed correctly. Oh my gosh, yes. And you have to watch those bills when they come in. Of like, did I get that? Wait, they didn't run that through insurance. They're trying to get me to pay the full $278. That should be run, run through the insurance. Mm. So, and then... Or you're billed twice. Uh-huh. Um, and then just tracking what I've paid, what's outstanding, what's been run through insurance. Just to... Sh- to that pending as it bounces from... from Because right now I have... I had re- everything and I have it kind of organized of what's been paid. But when someone was to open it, they would not understand... Yes. ...my system. And, and I haven't told this to my husband, but... There might come a day where I have to let go of that because I no longer have the mental capacity. Yes. To and I saw it happen to my mom. She had paper bags of medical bills, and then and she would shift through them, and then they would just sit there. My hmm. grandmother had this that happened to her. They almost lost their house because she didn't pay the mortgage because she was in charge of the bills. So. Yes. That's something I know on the horizon. And hopefully it's never an issue, but I, I need a system that makes sense. At least so that you feel safe and okay with. Right, right. Um, of what gets paid and what isn't. Um, a vacation. A vacation. A vacation. Where? Mm, somewhere where the water's warm and I can snorkel with my kids <laughs> and we can go see kayaking and I can fall asleep to the sound of the ocean um, so it could be Hawaii it could be Santa Barbara just somewhere warm where um, the cold doesn't bother my joints but it's not yeah. too hot that makes my feet burn when I'm standing in the sun um, Goldilocks weather total Goldilocks weather so yeah definitely somewhere Southern California or Hawaii or some, and I don't want a lot of people there. I'm not, mm. and someone's like, well, let's take a cruise. I'm like, I'd rather put <laughs> pencils in my eye. You and my mother with yeah. the extra people. <laughs> yeah, I just don't want extra people. I, 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 and this is part of my spoons that I've, I've, I've changed a bit. I don't engage as as many people as I used to because I just don't feel it. Hmm. feeling it meaning I don't have the energy to expend and I don't want to have to try and make commitments like let's get our kids to hang out they're like no hmm. no no and not that I, 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 I dislike that person I just don't have the energy to commit to it um, so anyway um, a place where there's not a bunch of people I'm always afraid of the flaking because mm. I can say absolutely I would love to do this with you and then the day comes. It could be five minutes before and I have a POTS attack or I dislocate my hip and it's like, I uh, have Can't. a great time without me, but yeah. <laughs> thanks for inviting me. Right. <laughs> I appreciate the thought. So we could use a vacation. I would love to use the money that I'm, we're spending flying to Dallas, going to a wonderful warm place. God, and you have to spend so much money for the, those tickets to Dallas. And then hotel and food. None of that's covered with None. treatment. Fortunately, you know, I've gotten help from family and getting discounted hotels. Um, I've found so far decent fares. Um, so that's why I'm pushing for Oregon so that instead of Dallas, I'm flying to Portland. It would be so nice to sound like Airbnb decided that they wanted to be really nice to people oh. and set up low cost or no cost as part of their We Like People program for people staying near hospitals for treatments. I think I might just email it. I think you should. I, I, if anyone can convince people, you, <laughs> oh, you could nice. convince people. 
campaigner. I don't know. We'll see. But I think that's a great idea. I mean, if you weren't sick, I would say you should run for Congress. You could, you have that laser focus (laughs) and you're so charming. You could, you could get stuff going. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Bulldog. I've been called You are good at the bulldog. (laughs) I'm impressed by it. It's it's something that I really like about you that I want to like grab onto for myself (laughs) because I am, I am, uh, a fly with ADHD, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> to keep my focus on something long enough, that's that's a, a trait I admire. Mm, thank you. So, do you have any life hacks, like things that you have? Like, I just got embarrassingly excited about getting a Dyson V six that oh, yeah. is the four pound vacuum because yes. I dislocated my wrist with my other vacuum cleaner. Yes. So I spent way too much money, and I was so excited, and I'm still very excited. I like still vacuum. Um, Is that one of your life hacks? Yes. It's the way to get things clean, and you only have 30 minutes to do it. Uh-huh. You, you can't clean beyond 30 minutes. It doesn't have a cord. <gasps> Love that. And it's, now it's not big for large carpet areas, but I can get in on my kitchen. Mm-hmm. I don't have to sweep. I don't have to bend down, which causes dizziness. Yeah. And, and sweep into a dustpan. Um, I can give it to the kids, be like, go, go <laughs> vacuum up all the dog hair. Chase down all the dog hair. Um, so that's a lot, a life hack. And also a life hack is just getting my total children to participate more. I mean, I've babied them because I want them to have uh, a childhood. Um, and I enjoyed doing it. My mom was a working mom, so she didn't get to do all the stuff that I'm doing. Mm-hmm. So that's part of it. Um, but I think I need to ask them to step up more. So that would be... Um, certainly. And then, um, my version of clean has become a little bit more realistic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I no longer, um, climb on the counter to get the far reaches of my, of, uh, the corners to scrub. <laughs> I don't scrub the backsplash. And unfortunately the people who own the house before us put white tile as backsplash. No children, huh? Or they just didn't cook. <laughs> Or they had housekeepers. Right. Oh, they had housekeepers. So that's possibly a life hack. Um, I'm, I'm okay being a little bit more messy. Um, and then just telling my husband that, hey, you know, you need to get that toilet. It's pretty gross. Um, I don't know. I don't think I've... I don't think I've, I've, I feel like I've been so focused on this goal of treatment that I, I, I don't know if I've given myself permission to, 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 to do less. I often thought toyed with online grocery shopping to take that because that becomes like a big part of my day that I hate because I got to plan for it. I I, I have to go through everything I've gone through in my cupboard to see, make sure I don't overbuy. And by the time that's over, I'm done. I don't want to do anymore. And then I got to go to the grocery store, come home, unload it all, Mm. get it, put away, take out some of the gross food that's, that's, hasn't survived. So I don't know. So what's the downside to doing that? Why haven't you tried this life hack? It sounds like it's something you don't enjoy doing. So I, I honestly, cause I'm cheap. I've <laughs> never, I, I haven't found anything online that is as cost effective as going to my one grocery store, my Trader Joe's and getting everything I need there. I've looked at Amazon I don't know. I guess I they had the Amazon Fresh. Yeah, they have um, Google Express, Amazon Fresh. And there's another one too. Yeah, Google Google Fresh is like fourteen dollars delivery. Yeah. So, do I want? Do I pay the extra fourteen dollars? I don't know. Am I there yet? And that's always the question. Like, for me, it's not necessarily even about like the convenience or the cost. It's like, am I am I seeding ground? Mm-hmm. And I'm always so afraid to give up an inch of ground because mm-hmm. to get right. I probably won't get back over that again. Right. I mean, I, 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 now that I'm going to be traveling every 21 days, I think I need to give myself even more grace. So that's something that, you know, I could hand off the grocery list to my husband and be like, order all this stuff online. And I, that was one of my projects I hope wanted to get done this summer is I wanted an Excel spreadsheet of everything. I, I have, I have grocery lists for a year. I buy the same things. Mm-hmm. So why not have it on an Excel sheet? And that you can check it off when it's gone. It's just sitting down on the computer and doing that stupid task. I think there's actually an app that you can put your whole grocery list on. Yeah. That you can share with someone. Well, that'd be cool. I will look it up and find it for you. Thank because you. I tried it and I was like, I'm typing too much and my wrist is popping up. 
think that that could work out well. Yeah. So for your children, how do you talk to them about this? I tell them it's a family disease, that it is something um, that they possibly could inherit, but by the time that they would feel the effects of it, they'll be my age, and they will be completely new treatment modalities. I don't say modalities, but they were <laughs> new. That's a, a good big yeah, word for them to learn. Uh, there would be tr- options that to them that all I I won't I can't even think about. Like mm-hmm. right now with our disease, they're looking at. Um, CRISPR-9 technology, which is actually cutting out parts of mutated DNA and replacing it with healthy DNA sequence. That is crazy. That's like sci-fi stuff. <laughs> they're, they're testing that for that for our disease because they're a part of my the treatment that I'm getting is they call it RNA, ribo, ribonucleic acid mm-hmm. treatment. So it's, it's, it's leading in that direction. Wow. Um, or there's another company that deals it with like uh, getting your body to treat it like an immune response. Okay. So there's, I see hope in the future mm-hmm. for them, and I'm just right at the cusp. That's why I, I need to get on this treatment yes. so I can ride it to the next wave of technology that's coming out. So I explain it to them that there'll be options available to them that they're, if they get this, it will be a completely different story. And what I'm doing now is guaranteeing mm-hmm. that it'll be a different story because I feel I am modeling how to fight. Yes, I, you really do. <laughs> and that's, that's like how, how you, 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 you do not stop until you get what you have to get. You don't, you, you cannot take no for an answer. There's just, there's just no other option. And I want, if they, if they carry this recessive gene, I want them to, to know that this is what you do. Mm-hmm. You, and so I let them know that it's possible. We've talked about DNA. I've been talking to DNA with them since they were three almost in preparation for this, that, that, that if they carry this recessive gene um, and that mommy's working very hard not to get sick. I promised daddy at our wedding that I wouldn't get sick. That's one heck of a promise. It was like a line in the sand. I don't. I knew it saying it that I couldn't guarantee it, but if I told myself mm. and promised it to him that I would do everything possible so that I could prevent it. Okay. So, um, and that, um, I, I, I want to, I want to be here for them for the rest of their lives as long as possible. So I guess I, I, there isn't really a, a sentence that I use. I just say, you know, this family disease, and unfortunately their grandmother died and that's not something that is going to be part of my story. And how often do you talk to them about this? Is it something that you do a State of the Union every once in a while? I know. Like, sh- hey, this is what's going on with mom's health. And No, I don't talk I, I, I don't talk about my symptoms. What I do say is on those days, I'm like, look, well, my hands really hurt today. Mm-hmm. And I need you to, if they're giving me guff about helping, they're like, n- n- no. Mm. <laughs> you, you, you don't get to argue me why you have to do this. And I don't appreciate the attitude. I really need your help and I need you to walk and turn this around, attitude around. And it, unfortunately it's a guilt complex that I'm throwing their way. So I'm sure I'll put money aside on the therapy cut for that. But I figured she's, and, and what I've also tried saying is like, listen, we're all roommates in this household. You have to participate. That's, that's a really good way to prepare kids for life just in general. <laughs> I've, I've had a few roommates in my life, and yeah. wow, no one talked to them about how to be a nice person to live with. <laughs> right. So, Mike, we, we all live together, and so uh, I, I shouldn't have to, to do the things that you could do for yourself. So I've, 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 I've tiptoed into it. So I guess I, I only reason the only way I, I, I update them is something big has happened, like when I got treatment. Yeah. That was a big topic at the, di- at the dinner table. And I also gauge the response. If they want to hear it, I'll talk about it. But if they're like, can I have a cookie? <laughs> sure. Go get a cookie. That's probably a good way they can get cookies. Yeah, right? They well, probably learned that one. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like I've just fumbled my way through that and trying to be, give them their innocence, but not keep them sheltered. There's no good rule book for how to talk to kids about this stuff. Yeah, like I've shushed up relatives. Like, no, I don't want to talk about. Oh, don't they know? Well, this doesn't have to be the main topic. If you want to talk to me about this truly, then let's set some time aside. But what the assumption of like this is your family? These are your children. Yeah, you get to choose 
how to parent them. Like, that's, right. that's quite a big leap. On. Yeah, well, I've got some choice family members. But... <laughs> Choices. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I guess I have and haven't. But they know something's different. Okay. So, like, we have, um, we actually call it State of the Union, <laughs> where we sit down and we just sort of go through what all the chores are at the house. Oh, like, that's a good idea. we write down, or let's rephrase that. My husband's sweet, but I'm the one who writes down everything that gets done in the house. Like, this is what it takes to keep the house running. Mm-hmm. And um, after quite a bit of growling about chores that we were experiencing, I just sat down and wrote everything down, had a State of the Union family address with pizza. Nice. It was nice. Yep. And just went through, okay, what chore do you detest? Like, on this list, what would you absolutely not want to do? And then I just keep, like, okay, what one are you okay with? What doesn't bother you? Mm -hmm. And so they actually ended up self-assigning all the chores. And it was never a, oh, well, I I hate this. It's like, no, you chose this. Yeah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. We can talk again another time, but that was a decision. Yeah. And at least they got to see what it takes to run a house. I think that kids think laundry magically happens. Floors magically get swept. Yeah. Fortunately, mine are very my. You have to tell me when you're you're near the end of your your supply of underwear. I'm not <laughs> I'm not responsible for that. Oh my god. <laughs> and then when you're near, you need to bring your laundry into the laundry room, put it in the washer, put soap in, and tell me you're going to start it. Yeah. And I'll rotate it and get it in the dryer and get it in the hamper. But if you don't do that mm. and you run out of underwear, your that's your fault. Seriously. <laughs> I am not responsible for your poopy underwear. Oh, worst. Yeah, grossest. Worst and grossest. So, yeah, I, I think that would be cool to have a state of the union. I think it's coming. That, that time is coming. They're old enough now to, to digest, digest that. One of the hardest things for my kids was when I started, I don't know if it was hard for them, it was hard for me when I started using the wheelchair. Mm. And when we got the wheelchair. And... I had this visceral stomach punch when they wanted to play in it mm. and they would sit in it and just roll the chair around. And I'd be like, I, I, I cannot hate, handle seeing this. I hate <laughs> that thing. I don't want to see you. Yeah. And they like actually sat me down. They're like, no, we, we need to feel like, like we need this. Stop mm-hmm. telling us not to do this. If this might be our future, we need to, to be there and try this. Mm. And I don't think this will be their future. I don't know. But just the idea of it was like, and that visual was like Mm. a punch in the solar plexus. And even now when they try to sit in it, like you says an extra chair in the house, because that seems like fun. Yeah. It still feels like they're punching me in the solar plexus. Yeah, because you're a parent. You you envision them in the chair and you don't want to envision that as their future. No, I didn't want to envision it as my future. Right. That was, that was hard to accept and I don't want to, so I don't know if that's like, Yeah. Sorry, I went off on my own little no, tangent there. That's quite all right. No, I, 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 I get that. So, what is your best coping mechanism? What do you lean back on when you have absolutely lost your medical mind? cannabis? That one. Um, thank you, by the way, for yes, <laughs> trying it out. That gives me the emotional timeout that I need. Um, you know, my dog has been a wonderful uh, uh, harbinger of joy. She, she brings much laughter to the family and to me, and I get out with her. I go walking or I go to the dog park. She just, she's a lovely distraction. Um, I don't think anything is as happy as Poppy is when she gets to the dog park. Mm-hmm. Like, she dances when she walks. She just, like, jumps and then does an extra jump in the jump. And then, and then like, swings her butt around. Oh, my God. And then just looks at me like this is the best place ever, mommy. Yeah. <laughs> so I would say my dog brings me that she she she's she gives me a break in life. Um, I do like teaching. I do, I think you know my sister said, "Oh, this will be a good distraction for you." And I'm like, "Thanks," <laughs> but it 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 does. I think it it gives me a taste of 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 like income. What that was like. Oh, yes, your yes. own paycheck. My own money to spend however I please. Um, walking. Anything that gets my body moving and shuts down my brain. Um, I don't know. So I, 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 I don't know if that's... I don't know how many, how 
much. I've swallowed a lot, so I don't know if I have any. I, I, I don't have my coping mechanisms defined. I think one of the hardest things is when those coping mechanisms get taken away. Like, mm. the bike ride was my favorite thing. I mm. ten mile bike ride every day was my head clear, yeah. and when that got taken away, that was it's hard. Ah, oh, it's so hard to see ground, especially when it's like. But that was the ground that kept me sane. <laughs> mm-hmm. That was my sanctuary. Um, I loved doing yoga. I. Oh, I miss yoga. I miss yoga. I I might try getting back into Pilates again. Um, just to help me with my core because I, I feel that's important to have a strong core. I've gotten a little bit lazy. I don't know. I don't know what my coping mechanisms <laughs> are. I know I do things to keep my mind from the monkey brain from spinning into this, you know, down in a downward spiral. Oh, that monkey brain. <laughs> no, right? So I don't, I don't know what my coping mechanisms are. I know that I just do things to distract myself. It's a coping mechanism. Yeah, I like, guess so. Distraction. Netflix marathons. Oh. Coping mechanism. Doctor totally. Who marathons for the nerd right here. Totally. Uh, Girlfriend's Guide to Divorce. I blew through that. Such a that great was such show. a great show. Such a great <laughs> I love that show. I um, was not expecting to love it so much, but I loved it. Yeah, blowing through shows on Netflix. It's a lovely distraction. So the last question is one of my personal favorites. Favorite swear word. Fuck. Yeah. God damn it. <laughs> Does that even count these days as a know, swear word? I mean, maybe. That's, that's like right up there with my husband's oopsie daisy. I know, I it was really marrying him in spite of his inability to swear. Wow, because, I mean, shit fuck. Oh, nice to combine. Yep, shit fuck. And then, um, if I drop something on my foot, it's motherfucker. My father's from New York, and he's the one who taught me how to swear because he built a fence in the backyard, so I learned it (laughs) all. (laughs) And I'm not even going to try to say it, but he had every single word that could be remotely considered swear in English, and he somehow managed to string it all together as one syllable. Wow. And being from New York, all R's were dropped, and it's hilarious to listen to it. I still can't do it. Someday I will learn how to do it properly, but... Oh, that's awesome. It was fantastic. It was it was an epic win on swearing. Yeah. Yeah, I think definitely fuck carries that for me. I, I try to take it out of my vocabulary so that I, when I say it, it carries more emphasis. Um, and depending upon who I'm dealing with, fuck wit. Mm. You know, if it's a Must- medical professional who's not seeing my point. I won't say that to them, but it's definitely <laughs> a story that I will tell my husband. I mean, is, you know, this fuckwit. Um, shite. Mm, it's a good one. I do like shite. Um, yeah, I think that covers it. Not you, you, you have a good range. Yeah, a good range. Depending. And creative. And I, I try because it's sometimes that you do. I think Americans don't really swear well. They're not There's no art. There's it's an art. I think the Irish and the Scottish have got it down. They also don't insult well either. No. Unless you're a drag queen. Yeah. In which case. Then you're. Oh my God, that's a level of art. Yeah, and insulting. Yeah. And we we got into RuPaul's Drag Race, so we've yeah. watched like every season that we can possibly get our oh, paws on, <laughs> including the kids. So CPS will be knocking on the door any yeah, moment. I'm but sure, I'm sure. It's fantastic. Do you have any other things that you would like the people who are walking a both sick world to know about your daily life? Oh, walking in healthy world? Mm -hmm. Anything they should know about what it's like being here in sick world? And I totally lied about that other question being the last one, but... That's okay. You'll have to forgive me. Uh... I hate the word. How you doing? (laughs) I'm being held together with duct tape. Why do you ask? How about just, nice to see you. Mm. What's going on? You know, and it gives me the, the choice. I don't have to fake it. I don't have to say, I'm great. Fine, doing well. Um, I've been living with a migraine for three weeks. <laughs> and I put sungla- I wear sunglasses all the time. 
Um, you know, I, how you doing? Seems it's such a, a, sh- a, a very shitty general question. It's loaded. So loaded. You don't know that, you know, fine means I'm barely hanging on. Mm-hmm. I'm barely. So I would like that. I, and I think in general, how you doing and what do you do for a living should be removed from uh, American colloquial conversation. <laughs> it's just, it's almost like a bless to you. Like. <laughs> yeah, because it doesn't get to anything substantial. And you don't know the person with those questions. So what would you replace them with? Um, like, I, I'm just so curious because, like, I've been in so many situations. Good to see you. Yeah. What's new? I like to say. I like what's new. What's new? You know what's new? I got these great pair of shoes. Or I am on the search for the most comfortable pair of shoes that are not ugly. You know? I like that. I, I'm using that. I yeah. like that. And tell me, what did I say again? It said, what's new? Uh, okay, and what's I, new? I think it's a fan. Instead of how you doing, which, uh, uh, no, there's too much you don't know about someone's day or what's going on, and I'm guilty of it. But what's, what's new? That gives someone the option to talk about something that has nothing to do with what they're upset about, which they might want to break from. Totally. Or be like, what's new? Well, I just spent two hours on the phone with medical billing. Woohoo. Such a great Yay me, time. but you know what? I got it resolved, and now I'm not going to get charged $754. So that's what's new, and I feel so happy that's behind me. Or what's new? I went and I got, I found those shoes, and I bought them. Those wonderful pair of comfortable shoes I've been eyeing that are silver, mm. dance, go, Mary Jane. Oh, so there is an actual pair of shoes behind this conversation. Oh, I totally. Like There's okay. a metallic pair of of Mary Jane dance goes that I want. They're like $140. But I, I just, I got a red pair and I took a picture of the silver pair last year and I think I'm just gonna... And not that our family is that tight. Mm-hmm. It's just the personal expenditure. I, I feel like I am just straight out drain on the family's finances and anything above and beyond which takes care of my physical needs feels extravagant. Oh, I hear you. <laughs> so that's, that's, I guess it's another thing for the healthy world that, you know, my pair of shoes that I bought, you don't know how much that means to me. Mm-hmm. I've been, I, I have, I, since last October, I've had these one pair of shoes in mind. <laughs> that's a long time to hold on to that. You have self-discipline. Well, that, and I just don't feel like going out to Berkeley. A lot of times I'm like, I have to drive out there. I would rather be driven. And that's how I got those red sh- those red clogs that I love so much, is that we went out there for the day. Matt took the kids. They went and they bought. They had fun together along the, with the gourmet grotto. I got my pair of shoes by myself. Mm. And then we met up again. So Brilliant. It was brilliant. So I guess that's that's what healthy people I want you to know, is that you don't know what the, looks, what the littlest things make me happy and, and cherish that one errand that you get to that one th- that third thing you get to tack on your list and push through and don't ask how you're doing don't ask how ask you're... what's new yeah ask what's I new. like that you've just helped so many people <laughs> who have friends who are dealing with so much shit and they're like I love you I don't know what to say to you so you've just totally solved so many people's mm-hmm. issues it's brilliant <laughs> Thank you so sure. much for coming back and talking sure. to me because I love seeing you. So Thank I will you. take any excuse to chat okay. with you.